All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the David Paul Seymour Show. I'm uh, my great pleasure to be joined uh, today by Mr. Brian Ritchie of The Sword. Hello, the hello. Director, and uh, a lot of other cool other solo projects he's done. So, Brian, thanks for coming on, man, and it's good to see you. Oh, man, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's uh, great to see you as well. Excited to have a chat with a human being <laughs> during this strange yeah. time. Yeah, for sure. So uh, you're in uh, Austin, actually, or no? Where are you right now? Well, yeah, I'm a, a little bit outside of Austin. There's a, a town called Taylor. It's about 45 minutes, uh, like, northeast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a little, little burb. Sure, yeah. Same with me. I mean, I, I just tell everybody I live in Minneapolis, but in reality, I live in a burb outside of Minneapolis proper. So. Right. Yeah, no, that's kind of how it goes. I mean, we, we everyone used to be able to afford living in Austin proper, but uh that's become increasingly difficult over the years i uh i do own some uh some sword t-shirts but I, I just felt like wearing this oh it's very very apropos <laughs> thanks yeah uh so i was looking for a good excuse to uh wear that shirt uh this week and you were it so thank well thank you i mean any any day of the week any day ending with y would be a good <laughs> excuse to wear that one yeah yeah cool so, um, yeah, so, um, I, pre like I said, I appreciate you coming on and, and I definitely, you know, obviously I want to, I want to chat with you about, you know, some sword stuff, but I, I really like to concentrate a lot too on your solo projects that you've been doing in the interim. I mean, um, you know, galactic protector was a, a favorite of mine. That is very cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a really cool project to, to do. Yeah. I've always kind of made music. Yeah. You know, uh, just farting around, even if it was a little like <clears throat> four chord, little progression, little A, B thing or whatever. And, and I've yeah. always been into recording, so I have would just inherently record those things. And I got some new pieces of gear that, that made it a lot more exciting. And as I was learning that, it was like, well, this is something I should maybe take a little more seriously. And yeah, I yeah. ended up doing a record. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did because it, it's a fine record. Anybody out there who hasn't heard it, uh, definitely dig that out and give it a listen. So you you were you were originally you know from day one with the sword, or at least I, I if I read it right, I guess JD did did some writing prior to actually forming the sword, and then and then you, the rest of you guys came on board. And yes, correct. So um, you know I. I I am actually not the original bass player of the sword. Uh -oh. uh, there was a, a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Ben White mm -hmm. who um, played bass for a singular show. Um, <laughs> and then the show I caught, I actually saw the sword play as a, they were a three piece that was with JD on the bass at that show. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so on stage, he's like, hey, if anyone wants to play the bass in a spin, you know, come holler at me after the show. <laughs> That's a way to advertise. Man. Yeah, and so I was like, hey, I'm a shit, I play bass, you know? And I had known him uh, before he played in this band called Those Peabodies, who I had seen and, and we had shared bills with before. I had a, like a heavy, like, you know, kind of proto metal band called Pirates of Darkwater going that had shared bills with Peabodies and, and such. But he really didn't know me as a bass player. He knew me as a guitar player. So, you know, I was like, oh, no, 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 I started as a bass player and I started playing when I was 13. Mm. I'd love to do this. This is right up my street. And uh, he sent me the tracks, which was essentially Age of Winners minus Iron Swan and uh, Lament for the Aurochs. Um, but yeah, so I learned those tracks and, you know, I distinctly remember going into the, you know, shitty brick and concrete practice space that they had off of a, uh, I think it was East Fourth, and uh, you know, just like hearing the way that Trivet's Tom sounded, like the first time we ripped into Horn Goddess, or so yeah, I, these are like etched in my brain, and I'll, I'll n never let those go. But it's uh, that was kind of how that started off, you know, and we just were fortunate enough that we were kind of checked in with the scene already. Uh, you know, Kyle was a really good friends with. Uh, Graham Williams, who was booking shows, you know, JD and I also knew him mm. from, you know, being in Peabody's and, and Pirates of Darkwater, respectively. Um, 
So we, man, we kind of lucked out, got in there and got some good shows right off the bat and was able to play for, for, for like decent, you know, groups of people. Right. Right. Do you feel like, I mean, it, it seems like things must have really escalated pretty quick once you guys got up and running, um, you know, cause it, 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 I, I remember those days, I remember age of winners coming out and, getting into it and and then it just it just seemed like um things just really i would say more so than a lot of bands in that genre at that time you know what i mean things just sort of like everything cl seemed like it clicked just right for you guys it did it did it was it was i would say just you know a, very much the meeting place of a lot of a lot of things happening you know we we had a bevy of great songs to work from you know jd had he had amassed this just really powerful record yeah. uh and then we were all capable players of of really putting it out there to its fullest and and uh you know being the dangerous band you know and and like ripping through it and being like damn you know <laughs> god these guys really you know lighten it up <laughs> Yeah. You're Sorry. being beckoned. Yeah, no, I shut that off. Sorry. <laughs> Sound off. No, that's good. Um, but, you know, it, uh, like I was saying before, we were checked in enough with the scene already and the people that were part of it that we, you know, shit, when, um, uh, you know, bands would roll through, we were one of the bands that were kind of like top pick on, you know, who's going to open for these guys when they come through. Oh, you know sword mm -hmm. so and, and you know talk about things that really don't exist anymore it's like you know with all the package touring and stuff going on like you know it's really tough for local bands then to get a, a bone thrown towards them in yeah. that regard which was something that you know we relied on uh yeah. early that, on that was the way things were supposed to operate back then and before then and yeah. <laughs> Right, right, that you would have, like, you know, oh, you've got the sick local band that, you know, helps bring the people in for the, you know, for the for the nationwide show and or for the touring artist. And, uh, yes, so, you know, we hit the ground running. We had great songs. We had an album's worth of songs already. Um, we learned them really quick, and we started playing shows. Yeah. Um, and then, you know... I started playing with the band in April of 2004. We were on tour a year later with Trail of Dead in, in 05. And then a year later after that, Age of Winners was out. Right. And it, in retrospect, it seems like it took forever. You know, we recorded Age of Winners probably three times. Mess, you know, just kind of like, oh, let's, you know, let's record some demos. And then we would record some demos again. And then we would, <laughs> inevitably record some more demos and sound like tool yeah i mean you know there's a there's a couple of different i mean not, nothing like drastically changing about the the song structure or anything like that but just us doing it and kind of honing our skills sharpening the blade if you will if you want to be punny uh <laughs> but uh it was yeah it was it was right place right time right climate yeah. right everything you know everything just seemed to click um we were all prepared you know mentally and uh you know as far as like wanting to be in in a band that was going to go and and kind of live on the road for a while and you know we were all committed to that so mm -hmm. it was it, it worked very well in our favor we were immensely lucky in that regard yeah, that's awesome. This is it's just random and it's like totally like geeky, but like, uh, so um, somebody told me that, uh, and I did confirm it, you guys actually toured with uh, Metallica opening up for them at one point. Yeah, um, yes, we did. So if you don't mind, how, how was, what, what, what kind of ex what surreal experiences was that for you guys? It was immensely surreal. Uh, it forced us to, you know, grow as a band, like, kind of like over the period of a couple of weeks yeah. you know of realizing that okay we're gonna um you know we're, oh we're gonna have to get wireless gear now <laughs> like oh shit uh all right um i guess you know oh we, we need to hire like a monitor engineer 
Yeah. Uh, all right, you know. Yeah. We had we had so we toured with this band Trivium. Yeah. Uh, in like mid two thousand and six. Um. <clears throat> And they had done some touring with Metallica and they were, um, you know, were playing San Francisco and they're like, oh, Lars is going to come out. Lars is going to come out. And we had actually heard this one time that we played Buffalo. You know, the, people come up to you and they say shit to you sometimes and you're like, okay. You know, like you don't really know whether it, it needs to actually be retained or, it, or you yeah. know, take in stock. But this guy comes up and he goes, I know this is going to sound fucking strange, but I'm Sebastian Bach's cousin. <laughs> last weekend we were hanging out and blah, blah, blah with Lars or something and, or, or something to do with like, and Lars Ulrich loves the sword or something. Oh, and wow. you know, kind of like, okay. all right, weird. Yeah. You don't say, <laughs> you know? So sure enough in San Francisco, Trivium's like, oh yeah, Lars is going to come out. Like, okay, I guess we get to test this theory to see if yeah. you know, Lars actually knows who we are, yeah. you know? And uh, so, you know, we play the set, do the thing. Um, and a a as we're loading out uh, and, and getting our stuff off stage, Trivet comes up and he's like, Lars Ulrich's downstairs. He wants to hang out. He loves the band. I'm like, all right, all right. So we were playing this place called Slim's in San Francisco and it's only got three dressing rooms yeah. and Trivium squatted the entire dressing room zone and was like, Hey, you know, we're going to have some VIPs out tonight. So, you know, here's some bar stools for the alley uh, uh, basically. <laughs> and we're like, Oh, okay. You know, and we were, you know, we were green enough at that time that we were like, uh, I guess it is what it is. Sorry. You know, we took our bar stools and went out to the alley and Lars is like, you know, so what are you guys doing tonight? And like, well, we're hanging out in the fucking alley, you know, all right, well, I'm <laughs> hanging out with you guys. So we proceed to hang the entire trivium set. Um, you know, and he's like, Metallica is going to take you guys on tour. And, you know, we were like, God, dude, don't fuck with our emotions. That's not <laughs> cool. You know, we're just, you know, we're like a little club band. That's great and all, but man, damn. Okay. So he helps us load the rest of the van at the end of the night. And he's like complaining about how many symbols Trivet has in his case and shit like <laughs> that. And, you know, we kind of, it, we just thought, oh man, this was, as we were driving away from the club, like this is one of those like, nothing's going to top this, yeah. you know, that, that, wow. Yeah. You know, think he'll take us on tour. Pfft, never, you know, <laughs> that guy's loaded. Yeah. Like, yeah, that was, that was a load of shit, but man, it sure was nice, you know, but man, uh, about a year or so later, we were on tour with clutch, uh, Metall uh, Metallica hits Trivet up cause Trivet was our manager. Uh -huh. And I remember when he's, you know, fielding that email of like oh shit q prime just hit us up and wants to know if we want to open up you know this like metallica's sick of the studio like eastern european legs so we're like fuck yeah of course we want to do that so you know we go and do like saint petersburg and riga latvia and uh istanbul and, and it is just bonkers shit and you know we go from basically where every show was the biggest show we had ever played you know, yeah, what I was going to ask. So the level that you guys were operating at prior, right prior to that, and then like launching in, I'm sure like a big stage, uh, like was that a, a pretty significant leap or had you guys already been sort of graduating up to that or was it just? A no, I mean, we had like the maybe one or two like slightly bigger gigs that put us like we had played this, uh, Danzig had that blackest of the black tour. Uh, mm -hmm. and we played the Houston date of that. And that was probably, and that was in like the Verizon center. Uh -huh. like a 3000 cap room. That was probably the big, one of the biggest deals that we had played. And maybe some of the bigger clutch shows yeah. were, were in that realm. But yeah, it was, I mean, huge, yeah. you know, huge jump. Like where we had, to, uh, you know, monitor engineer uh you know taking stock of like you know having 
all the all the crew dudes and like who's who's delegated to what task because now there's all these things that we have to do and like you know no longer can we roll in the van because they want us there at eight in the morning you know to do load in so you know we were kind of forced into the bus for the metallica stuff because of that um we later kind of figured out a way to to get out of that arrangement in europe by having them truck our gear for us and at least <laughs> yeah. got to go back to the van yeah. which we preferred we you know we're we're not a bus band we don't like the bus yeah um but yeah the metallica thing was it was sick man it was like it was insane. It introduced us to people that I'd never thought I'd meet, uh, experiences I'd never thought we'd have, you know, watching uh, Trivet and James Hetfield have like an oyster eating contest that then <laughs> results in the, the show the next day being canceled because Hetfield's like deathly ill. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like shit okay. like that where like, all right, yeah I, saw, yeah, I saw that. I witnessed that in the flesh. That was pretty cool. I mean, I think the the only hardship that we faced was just the um, kind of the uh, nondescript nature of a lot of that touring. You know, uh, the the stuff backstage is all look the same. Everything looks the same. Your bus looks the same. You kind of get locked. It's kind of like what's happening right now. You know, where you kind of get locked in this, like, what day is it even? Like, weeks have passed, I, I guess. Yeah. You know, that's bus life. And that's part of the reason we don't, we don't really like it. We like to have that experience of traversing, yeah. you know, to, so it actually feels like something. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I could, I could, I could get that. But yeah, man, it was a, it was a hell of an experience. It was a wild ride. It was, uh, you know, it was, it was so much fun. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, I want to I want to ask you, like, um, I feel like um, and other fans that I'm friends with feel like, like, you know, sort of the 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 transition going from like Apocryphon to high country and, and that whatever is like musically seems like a pretty big leap. Um, maybe wasn't to you guys or, or whatever, but that's, that's, that's kind of the, the realm I'm curious about is like, what was, um, what was the process, you know, kind of going from one to the other and, and what did that kind of look like for you guys? Uh, you know, it was, um, with every record when it finished, it was never like a thing that we discussed about like, all right, so, uh, see you next record, you know? <laughs> That was we never talked about that it was always just like songs would exist mm -hmm. we would learn the songs eventually there would be enough songs for a record we'd make a record we'd tour on it we would do the tour and the cycle would repeat you know yeah well after apocryphon you know i remember uh thinking like man we have really like you know i felt really good about the the fact that we had you know, lost Trivet mid album cycle with Warp Riders, but kind of like collectively gotten our stride back then with Jimmy coming on and then doing Apocryphon. I felt like really confident in like where we had kind of ended up. Mm. Um, and then it was like, well, you know, tour cycle's over and we're not really you know, once again, not really talking about what the what the future holds. It's just gonna be a thing. And then you know, the next batch of songs that JD had were like a lot more open and airy rather than like riffing and like, you know, kind of, uh, I don't know, metal for, for lack of a right, right, term, right. I guess. Um, you know, and personally, I saw that as a opening for like all this, you know, because I had already had the Taurus at that point, which is the foot keyboard. And I'm like, well, you know, anything I can do to throw in a few more. And I feel like this like really open song structure bit, you know, is, is a perfect avenue for me to, to get in here a little bit more and, uh, you know, sonically. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, it wasn't anything that we talked about necessarily. It was just this thing that kind of organically happened. JD also moved 
um, which I think kind of changed his headspace a little bit sure. and allowed him to write songs that he didn't know were there before. Sure. Um, you know, I, I uh, penned some songs for High Country after, yeah, never, you know, I've always had music, but I've never, like, I'd never wrote a sword song or anything like that you know i'd had to have suggestions on like you know oh could we do you know when this chord hits this chord could it actually be that chord you know it was yeah. you know, silly yeah. arrangement style stuff like that but i had never like pinned a, a track yet but then um you know i i had started writing songs and demoing them in the house more than i had in, in times past and getting kind of excited about things i had also moved out here a little bit outside of the zone. So that was inspiring to me. Um, you know, I think we all kind of found ourselves in a little bit of a different spot. Yeah. And I think that transitioned into how the, the, the songs ended up, how the record sounded. Um, you know, we did it here in, in Austin with our buddy, Adrian Casada, uh, who's in that band Black Pumas now. If, if you've never, if you haven't heard of them, they're no. molten hotness. <laughs> um, about to take over the world duly noted we'll check it yeah. out but uh you know we had heard some record he, he plays in this great or played in this great band called grupo fantasma back in the day that had they were princes backup band for a little while and so they were buddies of ours and you know they'd always want to know metallica stories and we always wanted to know prince stories so we you know there was a lot of hanging out there and when we got time to like doing records there was this band called the uh, golden dawn orchestra mm. and adrian had done a golden dawn record that we all thought sounded really cool so we we're like well let's see if adrian can you know lend some of that special sauce yeah to our record yeah you know? and and we all we all kind of wanted to make a different record i think um and again it wasn't anything that we talked about it was just i think it was just something that was in, in everybody's head that mm -hmm. you know we had made four metal records yeah you know and um they had i mean even to me like if going back to gods of the earth like made mother and crone you can throw that i think on any sword release and i think it it you know it, it doesn't doesn't stand out as being strange mm -hmm. you know some of those rock more rock elements were there and had been there kind of hanging out for a, a little while yeah no i agree with that um yeah, I, when it first came out, I remember that it, it, it felt like how I reacted when, uh, I'll get a little non-metal here, but um, like when Radiohead went from OK Computer to um, like Kid A or whatever that, out, that, that first album they did in that line, you know, after that. And, and I was like, huh, I don't, I don't know if I like this, you know, why does it sound <laughs> so different to me? But yeah much like your guys record the more i listen to it i'm like this is just a mature fucking like um you know um transition you know and like it it, it just the more i listen to it the more it made sense to me it was like wow these guys you know they're they're exploring something new it's such a mature thing to me sometimes to to say like let's we got this so dialed in and like it it, it we could we could stay on just kind of keep making the same uh type uh, you know music or we can like really allow ourselves like you were saying to explore other options and to and to grow and i feel like it was maybe a growing thing it strikes me as you know and like and uh and i i dig it man i think i think it was a cool like you know like i said like a maturity transition it almost felt like you know but it's still a fucking rock album it's still like you guys didn't all of a sudden start doing uh, you know, club music or something like that. You know? No, no, no. It's like, you know, for as much heat as we, as we took off of it, I mean, you know, you've still got tracks like Empty Temples that kind of retain some of the, you know, like Thin Lizzy, dueling guitars, you know, gallopy sort of thing that we've done <clears throat> in times past. But, you know, I think any time that you, uh, uh, you know, music's become one of these things that like, it's, it's almost like a brand. Yeah. You know, where like your band is a brand and, and oh, you're, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, you're expected to, you know, retain the, the qualities of Coca-Cola throughout the 
same recipe. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's yeah, the same recipe. And and uh, I mean, I don't know. It feels so strange to me as someone that creates mm. to create. You know, I don't like. I don't create with the sole intent of how it can be monetized. Yeah. You know, that is a, a very fortunate byproduct of what, you know, what has grown to be out of the things that I've been involved with. You know what I mean? I I've lucked out in that regard, but that it was not ever the antithesis or the starting place of why I got into music or anything like that. You know, it was just a, an expressive expression of, creativity or, or 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 really like just wanting to like be like green day or like cop nirvana vibes you know what i mean and like play smashing pumpkin songs with my friends at their house right you know so um whenever you deviate i think from just the the brand in general people get really kind of like oh shit yeah. like, i don't even know how to feel about this like i yeah. i now 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 i'm the one who's questioned you know now 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 the onus has been placed on me to to do the uh to do the thinking to do the heavy lifting in this scenario yeah do, like oh do i like this like do i like seriously mysterious like yeah. I, I mean it's a good song but you know but do i like but yeah. you know it, we, we put we've we, we've we've we force people into like a little bit of a hard place with that you know but yeah. Fuck them. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't mean that to sound like insincere, but I mean, you know, let the artist art, yeah. you know, uh, I'm sure you've been placed into that scenario multiple times where, you know, someone expects something out of you and, and maybe you, you know, don't necessarily want to fulfill that yeah. in that regard. Um, you know, I'm sure if we made age of winners two, gods of the earth two, warp riders two, you know, I, I'm sure people would be very excited about that, but that wouldn't necessarily fulfill the creative, like artistic side of, yeah. you yeah. know, of doing something that comes from a genuine place. Yeah. I, I've, I've always said, I think when you, when you, um, you know, you have a band who they, they are maybe aware, um, and I'm just speaking broadly, you know, that uh, their fan base would like react volatilely, volat harshly you know if they change that coke recipe on them yeah but i think when you as a as a fan base of a band or or any kind of creative thing that you enjoy if you keep them locked in that box you run the risk of them just not just going hey you know what you see it all the time they, they break up they splinter off they go do other things because they're not getting fulfilled and so if you truly care about the brand the you know the sword that, yeah you know let go along for the ride and let those guys do their their what they got to do so that they they want to stay around if you're really a fan and you want the band to survive you know what i mean that's my take on it other people might have other opinions but um you know i think that's a, a good way to look at it you know it's it's true i mean it's it's creativity yeah you know it, it's it's a strange thing for creativity be or creativity to be monetized yeah. in that sense um but fuck it is what it is yeah you know and and it's you just have to figure out like how to navigate through the sea yeah you know uh it's but yeah it's <laughs> it's a yeah. weird ass world isn't it yeah it is so I got really stoked, and I'm sure a lot of other people did, <clears throat> when I saw that you guys were kind of coming back from your hiatus with uh, this Primus thing. Yeah. I, I'm not for sure. I apologize, but I think the Primus thing was 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 the kind of come back to the sword moment, or 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 did that happen a little prior to that? Or no, I mean that was the thing that I mean sp spurred it on. We've um, we've been cooking up this the conquest of kingdoms chronology uh package we've been cooking that up for a little while mm -hmm. so we always had that in you know basically in our back pocket uh and we were going to have that come out regardless of any sort of touring basically just going to put it out and expect to, to not do any touring on it like it was just going to be a thing that was going basically kind of like a thank you to the fans of like 
you know, hey, here's all the B-sides, here's all the rarities, here's a couple tracks you that no one ever heard, here's some live shit that no one ever heard, um, here's some scanned posters you may have not seen, here's some awesome. scanned laminates, you know, just mm -hmm. fun stuff. Uh, JD wrote this really awesome, like, the story of the sword, which is, you know, comprehensive from, from A, to, A to Z in that regard. Uh, we had Lars and, and Neil Fallon um, and Mark Morton write a few things for a little booklet. So we always had that thing ready to go. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, all of a sudden Primus hits us up and it's like, yeah, we're going to do this Rush thing. We're going to go do, uh, we're going to go play this Rush record in whole. We're like, yeah, we're there. I mean, yeah. you know, basically JD, you know, yeah, it, it, I want to do it, you know. It's, and so then our booking agent calls me and is like, hey, um, you know, do, do you want to, you want to, you guys, you know, want to go on tour? I'm like, well, yeah, you know, what, what what's the deal? Like JD, JD's, you know, JD said, yeah, you're like, are we going on tour again? Like, what, what the fuck? And, and yeah, sure enough, JD had, you know, had, had agreed to, to entertain the idea of this tour and like oh yeah here we go like i guess we're gonna play some dates i mean it's kind of like we love rush we love primus mm -hmm. um you know wolf mother is also very badass and was a yeah. huge thing that was kind of happening in parallel when we were coming up we were very much aware of them we saw them uh in austin back in those early south by days uh, play some really small shows so it was uh it was kind of a no brainer um but having everybody on board was you know the icing on the cake yeah oh it's great yeah so i i don't recollect the, the what, what all the dates were but when was that supposed to kick off and is <laughs> bullshit that's going on right now uh, yeah yeah that's kind of a thing yeah uh so it was going to kick off in may may 26th um, but it has not officially been moved back, um, but it will be moved back, I reckon, to sometime later in the year, maybe uh, late August, I would reckon. Um, but fuck, dude, who knows? Do you think we'll be going to shows? Well, here's the thing, man. I've, I, I'm, I'm not the biggest news hound, but I, since all this has been going on, I found, I found that I've been a lot more involved in like the news every yeah. day, watching the evening and reading economists pod, you know, or uh, articles and pot listening podcasts. And I can, I've had a few friends of mine who s sent me stuff cause they know I'm in the business per se, because my, my business and output is directly linked to what all you guys do. Oh, absolutely. For uh, sure. But uh, they sent me a couple of articles that these guys are saying that uh, concerts and public, you know, things aren't, aren't going to be back until like the fall of 2021. Oh. So I, don't, I don't, who the fuck knows? And I don't know who said it. I'm a big kind of read the, the headline and the, the first paragraph kind of guy. So I don't, I don't know who's, who they are that's saying these things for sure or what the validity to what they're saying is, but God, that'd be a fucking bummer, wouldn't it? It would be a bummer. It would be a bummer. You know, uh, I got to say though, <clears throat> unless, uh, you know, unless we've got a way to figure out who, who would be sick and who's not sick or, or whatever. I mean, what, what, it, uh, I, I mean, I would never go to a concert. Yeah. So I, how do I, you know, how, how do I expect people to come to, to a show that I'm playing if I wouldn't go? Yeah. You know, so it's, it's a tough thing for me. I, 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 as much as I want to go out there and, and rock, I would love to, I want to go hit those riffs. I want right. to play iron swan. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want, I want to go to do rock. that. So, um, exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, yeah. You know, and as do I, I want to go see, you know, my friend's bands play. I want to, you know, go catch, touring shows that are they're rolling through town you know I, I hate it i can't stand it but at the same time like you know we'll, I, not just for entertainment like i i don't know that i would ex would put myself in a position where you could potentially get like deathly ill mm -hmm. you know or, or 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 potentially like fuck someone up that you you care about you know your your pops your mom you know Oh, and then God, if this whole deal like keeps going and, and no one's got any cash, there ain't going to be anybody buying tickets anyways. You know, it's, it's, 
it's it has it has the uh the possibility to screw the whole pooch for so long you yeah. know i yeah. i i, I I try not to play the tapes to the end too hard sometimes on that stuff, but man, it, you know, like, Oh God, you just watch it rolling down the, like the snow bill, uh, snowball rolling down the hill, like the, in Willow, you know, just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And God, well, my dad always said a snowball rolling through a junkyard. You know? mm. Yes, sir. But yeah, I, those are the things I'm most fearful of is, is, I think the health thing will eventually level off. And I think it, it, it's given what we've seen so far that, you know, I feel like we've seen the worst of that part, but it's the after effects of like, say economically and socially, what I'm concerned about is like, even when we get to all clear, I mean, are, are people going to be afraid to go to shows? Oh yeah. Are be afraid yeah. To gather together and hang out. I was saying before in, in another, when I had another somebody on that, my my guess is like because they they were very much like oh man you know it's going to leave people they're not going to want to get close they're not going to get together i think that'll happen initially you know the first year maybe or something but it's just human nature man we we kind of forget about things and then we kind of <laughs> let let our guard down we just slide right back and you know 9 11 was a good example i mean there was such a heated time right after that but then you know the, it, all terrible things luckily get forgotten and we try to get happy again and we you know we're just social creatures who like to gather we like to be intimate and close we like to like sit next to each other and talk you know and have a beer and listen to music I mean these are things that we I feel like we can't live without I mean if it weren't for those things then I don't know that we'd be a very tolerable people you know what I mean no I mean you could argue that we we would have never got to the place that we are at today without people coming together and socializing right, right, right you know so if if that uh, yeah it it's it has the chance to fuck shit up for so long you know that's the thing that i'm truly worried about is that just you know yeah it's ever long long running effects from people being concerned and you know being apprehensive and or not being in a financial place because of you know the, previous unemployment or anything like that and right you know who, who knows what the hell is going to happen with this shit yeah no doubt no yeah doubt. i got my i got my twelve hundred dollar stimulus check i got that you know uh but well, from where mine's at man i'm gonna i know a lot of friends who've gotten it and i'm like hey man i could use it but you know. dude like i'm still short on the, on the mortgage you know what i mean uh and i don't even feel like i've got something that's really that expensive you know my house is 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 kind of tiny actually and yeah. you know I, I hope that they've got plans to do more for people because you know a one-time check of twelve hundred dollars and a pat on the ass it's like yeah cool yeah and it took like a <laughs> fucking month just to hit everybody you know from the time they started talking about it to arguing over it, passing it and then it getting into the banks it's like Hey man, we need we need a lot more. We we have to op we're gonna have to like turn that valve on somehow and like we just oh yeah open that bad boy up yeah yeah. <laughs> but then that's gonna wreck all kind of shit because I think you know you don't have to be an economist to know that the you know those kind of measures aren't sustainable to the you know the good the, the this is in no way political at all. It's just a, a, a economical fact that like you know the government can't like just give everybody print money and give it to everybody every day to cover their bills. So we're going to really have to come up with something. <laughs> yeah. It's going to, it's going to fuck the whole damn thing up. It, it, you know, it's, it's, it'll, it, every crack will become a Canyon. Yeah. You know, uh, never it's something I didn't think that I'd see in my lifetime for sure. No, man, this feels like, like world war two. And I, I, my prediction is going to get into like, the great depression era, like, uh, I, I don't want to be an alarmist or extreme, but I, I think we all kind of know in the back of our mind that that kind of shit is coming down the pike. And, uh, but you know, maybe some really smart people who've studied their history and, and, and have a handle on things can, you know, navigate us through that and, and, and not it turn out to be a huge deal, but I guess we'll see. But Fingers crossed, man. Fingers crossed. I just want to rock, you I know, know? I just wonder, I mean, I'm sure you just wanted to create some art. Yeah. You know, just 
like, can I live? I know. <laughs> I know. Just let me be me. Just let me live. Well, speaking of rocking, man, I, I, I definitely want to make sure we save ample time to talk about your solo stuff. Cause oh, sure, it's, sure. It's, it's very cool and very impressive. And enough of this downer talk, man. Oh, it's, yeah, yeah. The doomer. Yeah. So tell me, tell me about like, run us through, give us, give us first like the Wikipedia overview of your solo output. And then I'm going to just turn you loose to talk about any of it in any way you, you want to, you want to talk about it or plug it. Sure. So, you know, um, I've always been interested in recording music, you know, um, mostly because I'm cheap uh, and I don't, you know, I, paying a recording studio or something like that, you know, that, that wasn't an option for me as a, you know, a kid growing up in Round Rock, Texas, Yeah. you know, so I, uh, we would rent um, like a, a little rehearsal space that had a PA and the PA had a RCA jack, you know, that you could take the, like the mixer output basically. So, you know, I started with, with recording that, you know, our band's, jam space jams basically that way and getting into the idea of like oh shit well you know wow they they each track is its own thing and like a professional deal like you have like the kick drum track and the snare drum track and oh shit you have the under snare drum track you know <laughs> and all this sort of stuff and meanwhile you know i'm just like left and right you know just a stereo stem basically and i got this creative blaster sound card when I was like 16 or 17 that had a, <clears throat> like a little five and a quarter bay breakout box that had RCA input on it. And so I had a little Behringer mixer and would have bands over and we would, you know, I'd set them up in my parents' living room and we would, you know, record the entire drum set as like a stereo mix. And like, I had no idea what it was going to sound like until I listened back to that stereo. You know, I, I, it makes me laugh to think about how, you know, juvenile in where I was when I started with it. And I mean, I guess I still am in a, you know, very much in a learning place. I, you know, I would don't at all claim to know everything there is to know about recording and stuff, but I have been doing it for shit, 25 years at this point. And uh, in some capacity, you know, be it like, you know, semi, you know, where it was helping putting, you know, food on the table and in times where, you know, I'm just doing it by myself, you know, dicking around basically and like kind of just learning my stuff. Um, but I've always recorded things. I've always recorded little ditties, little demos of tracks that I was working on, even if it was nothing that eventually became anything. Um, just doing it to do it. Um, just like I said, just to learn gear or like get familiar with new things that I had bought uh, and, th and things in that nature. And then, uh, when we were doing, you know, Age of Winners, um, so I recorded Age of Winners and Gods of the Earth, right? And so when we did Age of Winners, I kind of just did it on whatever I had, which was n nothing, you know what I mean? It was the cheapest stuff. It was, uh, don't tell me you recorded Age of Winners on like a Tascam four track. It's not, a, it wasn't a four track, but it was a digital, it was called the Roland SI24. And it was like a, it was their eight channel, eight channel in box that had a, um, like a box that had remote faders and stuff on it. Mm. It was a cool, cool thing, but it had, um, the software that it used was the PC version of Logic. And, and I think, it only was a PC version for this one version and it was not a good or helpful piece of software at all. Um, in fact, I, I think that it probably worked against me more than it helped me in that scenario. But, um, you know, I borrowed a beta 52 kick drum from a friend of mine and a pair of Sennheiser 421s. And I had like, a, my little like, prosumer AKG microphone that I had bought a couple of years prior. And, you know, I was able to, you know, have everything multi-tracked at that point via that rolling board. And that was really a big leap for me because I had been recording a lot then with everything being just the stereo stem. And so when I was able to get everything on its own, I, you know, I really leveled up yeah. and felt like I was able to do a lot of really cool new things just by, virtue of these ideas that I had 
been holding on to, but you know, never been able to really like utilize. Um, now I got the toys, right. Yeah. So it was, it was a cool deal, man. We did that. And then when I got, um, or when we did gods of the earth, you know, I was like, Hey, there's a little bit of a recording budget here. Do you think, you know, we can buy me a few pieces of gear. So I got a night, like a nicer microphone and some nice preamps and like an 1176, uh, 76 style compressor. And then, so then I had some like kind of prosumer gear and I would get kind of hung up a lot uh, past that. Anytime I wanted to create myself, oh, well, I need to go through my nice preamps or I need to go through this, you know, nice signal chain that I have or else why am I doing it sort of deal. And um, I finally let go of that. I bought a cheap laptop and a cheap MIDI controller, like USB MIDI controller. And I kind of forced myself to work that way because I knew that plenty of people did. Uh, that was their workflow. So certainly it could be mine as well. Yeah. Um, I just needed to figure it out like anything. So I, you know, plunked down the cash to get the laptop, get the MP, uh, it was like the mini MPC or something. It's a small little keyboard with some pads on it. So I felt like I could, you know, tap out some beats or whatever if I, if I needed to. Right. And, uh, when we were doing, we were doing the doom side of the moon thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's that on the run sequence. Yeah. Um, and I bought this, uh, Moog mother 32 to do that, to do that sequence with. And once I synced that up to MIDI, man, I was just like, it was like back to the future, like the car going by with the flames off of its <laughs> wheels. You know, that's, that's how I felt. Cause I was like, immediately now I was synced with my software, which was something that I knew well already. And now hardware, which was something that I really didn't know all that well, you know, like I'll, I'd be the first one to admit that I was like a preset guy with, when it came to like synths and stuff like that. It's like, I'm not going to really like, I uh, made this preset. It sounds great. Like I'm not, I don't need to edit any part of the sound necessarily, you know, because this preset is here, you know, but then getting into that kind of, kind of forced me to like figure all that stuff out. And, you know, it was great. I, I, I it was probably one of the best things I've ever done for myself, you know, figuring out how MIDI worked and, and, you know, learning a uh this program called reaper which is a digital audio workstation just like trying to really learn that inside and out and how to do all the automation and stuff and um i've always been kind of a computer geek anyways you know um so it, that sort of stuff kind of I, I like that anyways yeah i like dicking with you know oh this new program came out oh cool i'll download it and <laughs> mess with it for a while you know I, that's that's the kind of guy i am um I may never touch it again, but I'll do it once, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was just stuff like that. And eventually I had all these songs uh, and I had this, like a, like a folder worth of them. And I was like, shit, what am I going to do with this thing? And uh, put them out. Yeah. Right. Daniel. So Daniel Davies um, from that band, Year Long Disaster, who was a band that the Sorted toured with, a, you know, numerous times over the years, he, he puts out a solo record, right? Yeah. And uh, I, I guess I should back up a little bit and say that Daniel Davies is uh, John Carpenter's godson. Ooh. Okay. So, yeah. So when, when John Carpenter started doing all of that touring on, um, shit, now I'm spacing on the name of those records. Do you remember when he put out those kind of more recent records? He did two of them. And uh, so what? he's, so he started touring on him, right? And so his son, Cody, uh, was in the band. And then also Daniel was was in the band as well. And so when they came through Austin, Daniel hit me up. Hey, man, let's go get some Thai food or whatever. So I'm like, hey, man, you know, I've been writing all this music and stuff. He's like, oh, you should, you know, just keep recording it and, and yada, yada, yada. And then he put out a solo record. I'm like, shit, I got to holler at Daniel. So I holler at Daniel. I'm like, hey, what is, what's up with this, like, solo record? How did you do that? You know, yeah. give me the skinny. You know, and he's like, well, I found these guys and, and uh, they hit me up and wanted to release this solo record. And I'm like, well, can you send him my stuff too? You know, <laughs> uh, you know, can you, can you throw me a bone? And he's like, yeah, sure, sure. So uh, I, I sent him the tracks and, and um, he sent them on to the Burning Witches guys and, and they got in touch like within the next week and, and were like, hey, you know, we would love to put this out. 
and their deal was you know basically nothing more than like an e handshake and yeah. and that worked for me i didn't you know yeah. i didn't i wasn't going to i knew i wasn't retiring off of a solo career yeah you know what i mean so i was just happy that it was no longer going to sit in a folder on my hard drive you know that it was actually going to be a tangible thing that 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 people might actually enjoy um you know i kind of like had that self creation bias of like you know, well, when I'm driving around and listening to it, I enjoy it. Yeah. You know, but you, you kind of, you kind of get to that point with things sometimes where you're like, you know, you, it's just, it's this thing of like, well, any, will, will anyone actually like this? It's, it's the, you, I, I went through this with every sword record when we would finish recording the record. And there's that three month to six month period sometimes of like what they call the setup, right? Yeah. Where they've got to get all their PR ducks in a row and make sure everyone's got their interviews and their promo photos and all that shit. Yeah. Boy, that is the worst time because you're just like, boy, this thing that I created, is this any good? Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I've been listening to it. I think it's good, but now I'm doubting it. You yeah. know, now, now I don't even know if it's any good. Now, will anyone even, well, I mean, is it pure trash or just like a minor dumpster fire? You know, and maybe that's just me, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'll be the first to admit that I'm a little bit in my own head sometimes with stuff like that, but no, I don't you know, think I, exclusively your outlook, man. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's probably shared amongst us as a, you know, once a uh, sentient mold, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I was just excited to have this thing out and it was, I was really excited that a record label was even interested in it. Um, you know, I'd shared it with the Razor and Tie people and, and got zero traction, really? you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, I was, I was pretty much just, oh, I'll just release it myself. And, you know, if 300 Sword fans buy it, I'll consider that a win. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I figured that was a plausible goal to it. To, to put out there like, oh, I could sell 300 records, you know, 25 bucks a piece or some shit. Yeah, I, I could probably do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, having a record label involved and having, you know, basically just to, to be able to say like, yeah, here's the stuff. I want it to, to look this way and be this way and this thing. And, you know, they just start firing it off. And at the end of the time, you know, they send you the box of LPs with your fucking name on it. It's badass. <laughs> So are you, right now, are you talking about the still talking about the Doom side of the Moon project? Or are you talking about Galactic? No, um, sorry, the Galactic Protector. I moved on to the Galactic Protector. The Doom <laughs> side of the Moon thing. You left you know, the station, man. Sorry, sorry, sorry. The Doom side of the Moon thing was basically just like a transition to talk about um, the you. fact that I got that one singular piece of gear that then kind of like opened my whole yeah. world up. But you know, Kyle handled the Doom side stuff basically has as his own label for that and, and and his solo project then at that point yeah okay you know which were you know i watched you know don't think for a second that that didn't play into how i how i viewed things with my own project you know watching the trial and tribulations that he went through with that and stuff right. like it definitely affected my thought on how i should do things um, I mean, I was even going to put the project under my own name. Uh, I've got a version of the album cover done that says Brian Ritchie mm. on it. Uh, but I got cold feet really at the last minute it was like, you know, I just, I don't want to have anything that I tie to my name that I, if it doesn't go in whatever way that I think that it should go, that it, it would somehow be a failure to me. You know what I mean? I needed to, I needed to remove that possibility altogether and by kind of like putting up a curtain with having an alias so to speak uh that that satisfied me you know because i then i was like all right all right it is what it is it's yeah. you know i i did it but it is this other thing and it's you know i it's cool you know yeah, and i could see too like i really enjoyed that album and a lot and like i could see it it, it almost has a band desk like a, you you could picture a group of guys on stage performing that work you know and so like that maybe also leaves that option over hey man maybe if i want to um recruit some friends and 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 take this to the stage once or twice or even a full tour then that option's there too absolutely 
and 100%, you know, have thought has totally crossed my mind that, you know, that would be something that would be really fun to do with those songs. Yeah. Um, I've played two shows. I played one show as a, as just me, you know, where I, you know, I, I stemmed out all the drum tracks and I, I played certain parts live and I had other parts triggered and, and whatnot. And then I did another show out here at the end of the year where my buddy Ray, uh, he, that lives here in town with me played drums and he was like the live drummer. Yeah. Uh, and that was a lot of fun too. Um, you know, I think it would be a blast to play some of those songs yeah. as like a full band. Um, you know, as I was writing them, I was, I was, I played in this other band, called Yukon Gold that I, I mean, I was constantly, you know, oh, I wrote this thing. Here, wrote this thing. You know, if you want it, grab it. Yeah. You know, or else I'm going to, it's going to become something of mine real quick, you yeah. know, but it's, it's, it's available for a short period of time. <laughs> Windows closing. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But yeah, you know, it's, I just, I'm, I, I've, I'm kind of never not creating in that regard. Yeah. You know, it, I, I've got, the second Galactic Protector record is done and I'm already work I'm already working on the third one. Oh. You know what I mean? Like I'm just yeah. and that and and that's not to me like that's you know, I I might write like four or five songs in a month, wow. you know, and put them together in a pretty complete state. And you know, I'm thinking that like with a lot of that stuff, you know, I, a lot of it'll end up being trash even even though i put a lot of effort into it or like what i'll do is i'll get real hung up on a certain thing or a certain sound or something like that like i, I really like slide guitar right now <laughs> i don't know you know what i mean it's just one of those things like i started playing i uh i was playing with alex moss from the black angels and he had me playing slide guitar for one of the parts and i was like shit i've never done this before and this is really cool yeah. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to take this, the slides coming home with me and, and I'm going to, you know what I mean? I'm going to use this on my own stuff. And so just over like the last say month or two, I think I wrote like oh, five or six tracks that kind of were based around the slide guitar, yeah. you know, and maybe one of them's good, you yeah. know, and one of them will be usable, but I, you know, you just kind of have to like explore the idea oh, to yeah. its fullest potential, Yeah, you know, and that was a lot of that stuff, even initially was just exploring the idea and, and yeah. uh, you know. Throw out, throw out five uh, five fishing lines and take one fish home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no harm in that when you're doing it yourself and it's your time. No. That's what I was going to ask you. Like, what is the revision process like, look like for you when, like, you don't, you don't have other bandmates to answer to. You don't have, like, somebody telling you, like, got to make this like great record to follow up this other, you know, uh, no. thing. you're just kind of doing your own thing. And like, how do you, uh, how do you keep it? Like where, where you kind of like, how hard are you on yourself? With Immensely. <laughs> it's probably it's way too hard. And, uh, it took, it takes me forever, Yeah, you know, cause I, it, it's one of those <clears throat> things that you can, you can always find another four bar segment to mess with. You can always, do something that no one will ever notice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can always automate something that no one will ever care about. Um, but you know, it's, that's part of the thing. It's like building Legos or something, you know, you're just piecing together your own little masterpiece. It's, it's yours. It's whatever you, it's whatever you want it to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, it, not having bandmates in this regard and then, um, yeah, trying to be objective about it is it's difficult. It's difficult because, you know, I want to show people stuff and ask them what they think, but at the same time, I want them to be brutally fucking honest, Yeah. you know, and, and take any, like the fact that we're friends, like remove that from the equation. Like, is, is this shit good? Right. Not because we're going to go, you know, have a Topo Chico later and like shoot the shit, but like, do you think it's actually like worth a shit? You know what I mean? But I, uh, that's always been a tough thing for me. Um, no lie. You know, it's, it's, uh, you just kind of have to cross your fingers and hope for the best, you know, and hope that you're, you know, just, just doing the thing. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a, a I don't even really know how to, how to explain it. Just it, it kind of like being true to yourself, like just hoping that you're 
making the moves that you feel like you should be making. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I have, I, you know, similar things, you know, for me, I mean, like when, when I got started in this shit a long time ago, like, you know, I, I would show a friend like, Hey man, for us in the sin of this band or whatever, like, does this look cool or whatever? And, and it was always like, yeah, man, it looks cool. You know? Exactly. And yeah. Like, and I realized too, that like, maybe they were being honest or not. But then I thought too, it was like, well, uh, I had a mentor a long time ago, my background's in architecture, but he always had these great philosophies and that's why I call him a mentor, you know, just not some, just some guy I worked for, but he always said, if, if, if you smile first, the, the, everybody else is going to smile too. It's, it's infectious. And, and if, if you love that thing, when you can look at it and go, yeah, it can always be better. Or it can always be like, you know, add to take away or revise or whatever. But like, if you genuinely look at it and you go, that's fucking cool. You know what I mean? And like, I'm going to stand by that. You got that much conviction in it. Then you don't have to worry about it, man. It'll, it'll translate to everybody else. It really will. And, um, like you said about being able to drive around in your car and listen to your own work and, and, and like, you're, you're happy about it. Then bam, done, you know? Right. Mission accomplished. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like you've satisfied the one person that truly matters in the, in the whole thing. Yeah yourself exactly. you know you gotta please you first yeah and everybody else you know because if as you know if, if you're doing anything to try to appease other people or like or like say bring money to hey man this is gonna sell this is gonna be like a gold record or yeah. like whatever you know what i mean that that's you've already lost the minute you ha try to adopt that mindset of guessing what people want or what other people are gonna like or whatever i mean it, it, that's the creator's conundrum always is to you know, either, either please yourself or you or you run your whole life trying to, you know, please others. And I think it's more important to please yourself, you know? Well, I think at the end of the day, you know, you can always live with yourself in that regard. Yeah. You know that, yeah, well, at least, you know, I, I did, I did me, yeah. you know, you know, hopefully, hopefully it doesn't it result in a, you know, a situation when keeping it real goes wrong, <laughs> you know, but yeah. it, you never know. Sometimes maybe it does. Sometimes it doesn't, you know, it's, yeah. I think, you know, I think you have to be comfortable with the expectation or with basically no expectation, mm -hmm. you know, that it it is what it is. And, um, you know, as much as you might want it, anything to be tangible or to, to coalesce into to, to this particular thing, it's like, it's, it's going to do its own thing, you know, and, and it's like, you don't have any control on the way that it affects people in the way that like, I mean, what you would call like the X factor, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like where the, like the resonance of, does this thing resonate with people? Right. You know what I mean? Like you, there is no algorithm for that. No, you can't predict it. You know? And so it, it, it does or it doesn't. Yep. And then that's just the bottom line, you know, um, there's kind of no halfway about that. Right. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, that's <laughs> some weird ass shit, you know, you, but I, I feel like staying true to yourself in the art that you create and just letting it always try to, you know, come from you, even, even if it's a place of like, Oh, I want to do this thing that kind of sounds like this other thing, or I want to draw this thing that kind of looks like this other thing, or whatever. It's 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 inherently always going to come from from you, though, even though if it's you're you know what I mean, like you're trying to, because everything's kind of like that, right? Like oh. we're all every, everything's copying the vibe of something else, and you're you know. Oh yeah, it's any, a, a million dude who uh, or group of dudes or whatever that come along and like you can look at what they're doing, whether it's art or music or writing or whatever, and, um, and, and go like, I literally have never seen, heard, or experienced that before ever. That's like a one in a million shot. The, yeah, best, the best that the rest of us can hope for is that like we've created something that's just entertaining and like exactly. thrilling and like, you know, and resonates and resonates yeah, with resonate. people. It just, you yeah. know what? It, it just, it's yeah. like, it just hits that thing where people are like, cool. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's, that's me. I, yeah. I, I'll buy that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll buy the ticket for that. I'll write that. You know, that train. Yeah. I've always said, man, my, 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 my greatest satisfaction is like, I'm not trying to be 
like create the next big thing. I knew I never was going to pull that off. I'm not that kind of guy, but like, if I could just create things that other people like, yeah. then yeah. Like, I'm happy, man. I'm happy. Dude, yeah. fuck yeah. I mean, that was like the end all be all for me as a young aspiring musician. It was like play a show that people give a shit about. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that was, was like the, that was the top, you yeah. know? It was it, th those sort of things, you know, it was never any sort of grandiose vision of like, oh, I'm going to fucking, I'm only being in a band so I can, you know, open up for Metallica someday. Right, right. You know, dude, if you would have told me that that was a thing when I was listening to my Injustice for All tape in the back of my mom's Oldsmobile, like wearing that shit up, you would have told me that I was like going to be on, on the road with those dudes someday, I would have like, get, get the fuck out of town. Right. That's, you know, that's a load of shit. Like, that's never going to happen to me. Right. You know, but it did. You know, it, 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 that's a thing that happened. But man, you know, like, fuck, I worship those dudes. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, that. Yeah. I, I mean, do you remember when the live shit binge and purge box set came out and MTV, like, premiered, premiered the videos, like the live videos from that thing one morning? I stayed home from school that morning. <laughs> like I, I walked to school late that day so I could tell my friends about these like kick-ass Metallica fucking videos that I had seen. <laughs> I'll go even better. I, I don't know how fucking old you actually are, man, but like I, I, I remember buying uh, the VHS of uh, Cliff them all. From, oh, yeah, from, yeah. From, yeah. From, from pulled it down off the rack. I was like, oh. And yeah. I'm like, those were the day. I mean, mo you know, a lot of these people watching may go like, I don't get it, you know, the, the excitement level there. Cause like everything in anything you want to see or dive into is all of it all over the internet. But back then it was like, right. Here's a fucking videotape. Oh yeah. I can buy, go home and watch fucking Metallica. Like, right. It's many times as I fucking want to. There was uh, oh, no yeah. outlet for that. So it was like, I, I just want to put it into context. And yeah, like I, I, I remember going through and like, probably had to buy a second copy a, a year later because I just fucking wore it out to where it was just like grainy and fucked up. You know what I mean? But Oh yeah. Dude. I, I mean, there was like uh, tape trading of, yeah. I mean like Dillinger escape plan videos and shit like that. I mean, I would get those back in the day because yeah. you know, like I, I was never going to see Dillinger escape plan or like propaganda. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. so it's like, I mean, I remember them, they came to voodoo lounge once in Austin, but I think it was probably not until um, Today's Empires, Tomorrow's Ashes came out in like 01 or whenever that was. And they were on like a, one of those no effects fat records tours that came through Austin. And Austin just exploded because, you know, propaganda was back. Holy shit, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, man, that's, it, you know, it, as much as, as a consumer, I absolutely love the fact that all the, this shit is available at our fingertips, right? Sure. You know what I mean? Um, you know, as someone that, you know, benefits from it monetarily, like it, it's a little, it's a, it's a, it's an irregular shaped pill to swallow sure. to, to not sell the stuff. But it, as far as like access to things and like, uh, you know, knowing that like there, it's like, there's no, there's, like no longer do you have these like anyone that's like gatekeeping bands because it's like it's not even a possibility anymore like the internet opened that all up and you you know you there might be some that bands that don't have as many views you know but they've but they're there you know yeah. what i mean yeah. you know the, the the gate is open and right and everybody can run in and out however Ex they want you know exactly yeah. you can you know I, I mean i didn't so case in point like captain beyond Right. I didn't find out about Captain Beyond until I was like 25 or 26. Yeah. You know, until I had been listening to Drunk Horse for years and years and years. And then, you know, getting with the sword dudes and then, you know, oh, yeah, you like Drunk Horse? You should check out Captain Beyond. Right. Oh, shit, Captain Beyond. All right. So, you know, went out and found those records. I was like, oh my God. It's <laughs> like Drunk Horse yeah. existed in the 70s. Yeah. You know, and then like so many of those experiences. Um, you know, is that uh, this is band Star Castle um that was like they got called being or they people used to make fun of them for being more yes than yes <laughs> like they, but I they write that down keep talking I oh yeah no so star castle is like that's so, okay that to me 
kind of like a epitomizes that whole thing of like you know bands that you've never heard of that exist right that like are now available to everyone mm-hmm. but i mean dude i remember when i found out about stark castle uh my friend baxter showed it to me my mind was just blown i loved yes at the time and i had been listening to fragile and close to the edge like still you know there. non-stop non-stop yeah. and so here's this band that sounds basically exactly like yes you know but it's just more of the the, the style that i like of yes you know yeah. um and well, i hope i hope it's where you, I, it's i hope it's what you're talking about is what i'm thinking because like that would be that would be great because I love yes, but like I also have some hangups with some of their catalog, you know. But um, I got big hangups, man. Yeah, I got if it's okay. Oh, you, okay, you ready for this one? Yeah. If it's not Bruford, it's crap. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like I I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Alan White. You're a fantastic drummer. Yeah. You're not the yes drummer that I care to hear. I'm sorry. Like Bruford's just the man. It's just it's the interplay between him and Chris Squire is legendary oh, yeah. and um and that's so i'm sorry you know my 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 yes catalog is very limited because of that you know yeah. people yeah. used to always be oh dude oh you love close to the edge man you should check out relayer or, or some yeah. shit and i like tried to listen to it once i'm like eh, i just don't know man i just don't know i i i feel this has gone into a different place and i'm yeah. i'm no longer i'm not, i'm not riding anymore <laughs> yeah i'm getting off yeah, yeah. but yeah star castle you know they've you know, that was one of those bands that like, you know, you could find those songs in the, or the albums in the record bin and the used bin, yeah. but they were not commonplace. People weren't talking about Star Castle, you know, oh, you know, this crucial old band, Star Castle. But right. now, you know, hey, there's shits on Spotify. You can, you know, if you're into prog rock or whatever and Star Castle comes up as a name, you can absolutely listen to that right away. You yeah. know, you don't have to wait to try to scour the bins to find a shitty copy. Yeah. You know, yeah. so that part of it, you know, I like I think about that. Uh, if if my kids are going to be into music someday, how cool it will be for them to be able to just have access to everything and listen to everything, yeah. you know, and there'll still be the whole discovery of hearing new stuff and like near hearing stuff for the first time. Like there'll always be that, but there'll just be just this wealth of stuff like it'll right. you know i feel like there was plenty of times where like i was in like that musical desert between things you know when i was younger where like i was really into this thing like really hard and and then it kind of wore itself out and it took a while before something came along and replaced it mm-hmm. you know and maybe that's maybe not the best in that regard because then you know we're just inundated with stuff but you know i i will say that i i do like the idea of it being you know, shit, you can listen to this record today and listen to this new record tomorrow or even an hour later. You know, you could constantly be um, taking in new art, yeah. you know, in that regard. Like there's, there's, there'll be no shortage of music to listen to, Yeah. you know, and not that there ever was, but I guess like music to be accessed, I should yeah. say, you yeah. know. Yeah, it's all at your fingertips. I love that. The only problem I find, and, and it's it's a good problem to have, but going back to those times we were talking about free internet, you know, you, you know, I had my little ritual every Tuesday or whatever it was that new albums would drop and I'd have my little list. I'm getting this, you know, and I'm getting, Oh, I heard that Danzig's got a solo album out. I'm going to get that, you know, or whatever. And you go down there and you get it and, and you get, you know, you come away with your maybe two, if you got a little extra, maybe three, you know, records or CDs or tapes, you know, that you go home with and, I'm sure you were the same way everybody during that era was the same way. We're like, you just listen to it on repeat over, oh, yeah. over, over, over again. Cause it's new and that's all you got, you know? Yep. And, and there's that freshness and that excitement and you kind of commit all those tunes and you're looking and you know, every name of every song and um, you know, you're, you're good with that. Now the problem I have is, yeah, I can listen to literally something new every soon as one's over i can go right into the next one and I, I i had this period where i was doing that because i i don't want to be that guy who just still listens to iron old iron maiden records or or you know or, or even old sword records or what you know i want to i want to listen to it's not bad you know but i think it's like i don't i, I want to commit 
I, I want to be able to commit these new things to, to memory. So what I've been doing lately is, is when I'm going through these new albums on the internet or whatever, Bandcamp or whatever, um, if I really find I like it, then I, I, I actually have this like rule. It's so OCD, but I, I make myself listen to it five times. Wow. Okay. Well, I can, I, I can get behind that. Sure. Before, before I can move on. If it's yeah. worth listening to, in my opinion, or you like it, it's worth listening to at least five times so that you, yeah. you kind of, you kind of lock it in. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think you bring up a, a, a major point to, you know, a lot of the reason that I feel like, you know, our, our last couple of records weren't that big of a hit with people is because of, you know, no one has to buy a record and drill it anymore. You know what I mean? You don't, like no one has to take the time like you everyone's everything served you in like five second you know buffered preview clips yeah and if like that riff doesn't hit you hard man then it's like then you're not gonna get it you're just you know the next album or yeah your, or you next. hear a fucking keyboard and you're like oh shit you know yeah. Yeah. so yeah it was that sort of thing i felt like you know kind of fucked us major um in in the sense of like once we decided to change things up that we were then you know it was like this uh the uh uh-oh thing that we kind of didn't really necessarily think about it's like you know oh yeah well no one has no one's buying these records anymore no one commits to buying a new thing anymore and i mean shit dude i i remember buying those records and like you know the first spin you'd be like "Mm." I don't know about this and then you know after dinner you'd give it another spin because what else was there to do right and then in the morning you'd listen to it again when you're getting ready because you know what else is there to do and you know by the time you're like god you know man i kind of think that shit's pretty good yeah. and you know there's not a lot of incentive in that anymore no, other man. than you know things like what you're describing where you almost have to like force yourself yeah you know to 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 do that you know and uh it, it like a, a forceful adherence to how it used to be, you know, I, but I, I, I mean, I think it's a solid thing because there's plenty of times I know just speaking from my own experience of not liking something and then coming around to it. Oh yeah. You yeah. know, like, uh, you know, um, Tame Impala, uh, you know, admittedly like it, when it, like I heard um, the, the first record and it kind of didn't, for whatever reason, it didn't latch on to me. I mean, I thought it was good, but I was kind of like, oh, okay, whatever, you know, that's cool. And I was recording this band called Woodgrain, and they were asking, hey, have you listen to Tame Impala? I'm like, yeah, I've heard it, you know? And they're like, oh, have you heard this new shit? You know, and it was uh, Inner Speaker. And it was, you know, that song, uh, Be a, be Above It or, or whatever, and where it goes into that, you know, Bop, 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 thing with the synthesizer in the middle and it kind of sounds like some like weird john lennon you know b-side that's <laughs> you're just like oh man i remember just having like one of those like stopped in the tracks moments of being like oh shit well whatever this is i have to hear this again yeah. and then i got that record and you know now i'm a devoted tame and paula fan i mean that that guy to in my opinion can absolutely do no wrong you know musically i that even that new record, I fucking love that new record. Currents, love that fucking record. Yeah. You know, yeah. all this stuff did with Mark Ronson, f- love that shit. You know, like wow, what a man, what a creative dude. You know, and uh, but for whatever reason, when I first hit it, I didn't buy it or anything like that. So at all, I, you know, it, I was not forced to commit to it. Yeah. You know, I, I, it was just one of those things I just heard in passing, and so I was like, eh, you know. Mm-hmm. neat it sounds that's cool sounds but you know but they're shit man even now it's like there's plenty of bands like that you know you hear the name a gazillion times and oh, i need to listen to that i need to listen oh you're you know mm-hmm. you just don't you know yeah. just goes right by you you know and you end up listening to the same iron maiden record you listen to you know 20 times before i mean not that there's anything wrong with that iron maiden's great oh, there's definitely you know? nothing wrong with that man. <laughs> i allow myself on fridays here in the studio to have uh i keep a uh, running spotify playlist of so much shit that I, I enjoyed from the time I was little till I think I've made a pr- cut off around like uh, maybe like um, like 
1995 or 1990 even maybe you know so okay it's, it's in that time yeah 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 and, and only fridays i let i let myself um go go and, back yeah it's like it's like nostalgia radio i'll give myself one day of nostalgia after that it, it's i'm like no don't be that guy man you get one day gotta be fresh yeah but you know and it's relevant to what i do too i don't i don't want to get commissions come my way or some bands hit me up and like i don't know who the fuck they are there's no way i could keep up with everybody at this point but like uh it's it's good to at least try you know so oh yeah absolutely absolutely i'm sure i'm sure plenty of that you know i mean just in the way that you know we as a as a band always hope that the artist like they're like listening to these songs and like you know getting like a good idea of like what we're trying to do right you know like i'm sure that's a thing that most bands would hope for that you know you're at least like in, in, in ingesting some of the source material mm-hmm. you know what i mean and, and not just like and, and trying to encapsulate the full thing like not only the things that they're telling them but maybe or telling you but then like some of the um nonverbal things that oh, maybe sure. that you can glean off of their music yeah. you know what i mean i could see that being a, a definite like advantage in, in that regard yeah yeah like yeah, the, the vocabulary you know it's like the unspoken yeah, thing you know yeah, it is it totally is yeah well um well, shit man i i feel like you've given me a tremendous wealth of your your time and, and I, oh sure yeah yeah dude i really appreciate it I'm, I'm super thrilled to be talking to you and uh um yeah man thanks for well, likewise man thank you very much i i dude i really appreciate the the offer to do this um you know thank you for thinking of me um <laughs> You know, I, 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 you know, very humbled that you uh, listened to my solo album and, and that, that, you know, that gives me like all the feels. So uh, I, I really, truly can't thank you enough for that. Um, you know, just on a personal level, that's immense to me. I, I don't, I have no expectations of anything. You know what I mean? I, 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 I try to shuck all that shit, you know, uh, just to, you know, I don't expect anyone to like anything I do because of things that I've done in the past or anything like that. So I, I truly do appreciate it, you know. Well, well and I, I got to say, because I think it's important to say, but <clears throat> I had discovered that record, um, you know, in my journey here. Um, and had I not even known that you did it or you say you didn't even, you weren't even in the sword before, it didn't make any difference to me. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that record stands on its own. I mean, it's obviously completely different, but, but um, I don't think the history that you have had made any influence on me. I'm a little more objective than that. So it, it, it it's a good, awesome record on its own merit. And I would have found it and loved it regardless. So. I really do appreciate that, man, that, that it, it really does mean a lot to me. You know, it really does. It's uh, you know, it's like, it, you just want to create you, you know, at the end of the day, if, if it makes one person, excited or anything if it touches one person even if they fucking hate it you touched them you know yeah i'd rather i'd rather always rather have uh people say they hate what i do than to just not talk about it at all you know well it's funny you know it's easy it's 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 a lot easier for people to tell you that they hate your shit uh (laughs) than than for them to it well you know what i mean it's it's kind of like one of those things it's like you know complimenting somebody or whatever is is becomes that kind of like it's a weird thing for people. Like they don't like, it's, it's tough. You know, like I remember like, dude, um, when we were doing that Metallica touring, right. You, you, and so Tony Canal, the bass player from no doubt. All right. Was at one of those shows and it took every ounce of my being not to just punish the shit out of him because I learned every one of his bass parts growing up, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, you, it's it's you have to just step away sometimes so it's i uh yeah yeah <laughs> that's awesome though man i can't yeah. imagine this story what we'll, we'll have to we'll have to chat again another time so you just do nothing but just tell me all your crazy stories from the road. I, I i it's funny man i i i remember most of that shit just like it was yesterday yeah. you know i i i i don't know if i've been blessed with you know some sort of like retention in my brain of being able to just like i i it's i'm there you know i close my eyes i'm there you know uh, uh, every one of those moments to like you know the the funny dude 
shit that I probably, you know, we can email about, you know, stories, but I don't, I don't, even want, I don't want to put them out there. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah, yeah, shit yeah. like that. But oh my God, dude, just, it's a, it's, it's been a fun time. I'm, you know, immensely thankful and just have so much gratitude for the, the life that I've been able to live and like the, you know, dude, I, learning Green Day parts incessantly, you know, not doing homework just to play bass, you know what I mean? Booking shows, you know, just giving every ounce of my being into being in a band and then, and then being fortunate enough that at some point someone gave a shit about something that I was doing yeah. or something that I was involved in. It's, you know, it, it's not lost on me at all. And uh, I am immensely thankful of the experience that I've had. And, and uh, I would love to tell you all the stories. Basically, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> fantastic hey and 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 before we sign off i want to say man like uh has anybody ever told you like you, you can't you catch your your face like just in the right like you, you kind of got a little paul newman deal going on and that ain't a bad thing really oh no I ever told you that no i've i've heard some funny ones jack nicholson comes up a lot but yeah like oh, i don't know ah, oh yeah i don't you, know he could do the the eye or whatever he does yeah it, like yeah, there, yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah no that's funny i haven't heard that one but yeah i'll oh. I'll, I'll, I'll i'll take it man he's a he's a handsome man he's a handsome devil for sure <laughs> i'll read into that I'm just saying you got a little, it's like it's there it's pretty it's pretty neat that's awesome yeah, that's super cool man well, Brian, thanks again, dude. I really hey, thank you, it. man. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And I hope, oh, I hope that that tour, because you guys got a date here, and, and I'm really hoping that fucking shit happens. At least by the time my date comes around, everything's right. Fine. I don't give a fuck about everybody else. I just, right. Just, I just as long as Minneapolis is chill. Yeah, as long as I get taken care of. You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, hell, you know, maybe they'll all be passing out those, uh, like the Wayne coin bubble things and everyone will just be in a bubble <laughs> in the, in the audience. Hamsters, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hell, whatever works, right. Whatever gives you the, I'll, the, I'll the social distancing. Do, man. We, issue hazmat suits at, at the door or, right. You know, yeah. There must be you, rock. You get free earplugs and a hat that has Matt suit at the venue. You know? Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Done deal with all ticket. Right. All right. Thanks so much, man. It was such hey, a thrill talking to you, dude. I, I really appreciate it, David. Thank you so much, and, and have a fantastic rest of your day. You do the same, sir. Have awesome. Bye, buddy. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.